The very first place that I can remember was a large, pleasant meadow. To start with, I lived on my mother's milk, but as soon as I could eat grass, she had to go out to work, and she came home in the evening. There were six young colts in the meadow besides me. We had great fun galloping around, although they would sometimes bite and kick. One day, my mother whinnied to me to come to her. Then she said, "The colts who live here are very good colts, but they are cart horse colts, and of course they have not learned manners. I hope you will grow up gentle and good and never learn bad ways." Do your work as well as you can, and never bite or kick, even just in play. My mother was a wise old horse, and I have never forgotten her advice. Her name was Duchess, but our master often called her Pet. As I grew older, I grew handsome. I had one white foot and a pretty white star on my forehead. My black coat grew fine and soft. When I was four years old, Squire Gordon came to look at me. He seemed to like me and said, "When he has been broken in, he will do very well." My master said he would break me in himself, so that I would not be frightened or hurt. Breaking in means to teach a horse to wear a saddle and bridle, and to carry someone safely on his back. He must also learn to pull a carriage or cart, going fast or slow, just as his driver wishes. He has to learn never to bite or kick, nor to jump at anything he sees. Even with a good master like mine, it was slow work, but at last it was done. Next came iron shoes. That was frightening, but the blacksmith did not hurt me, even when he drove nails through the shoe right into my hoof. My feet seemed stiff and heavy afterwards, but in time I got used to that. Now that I was ready to leave home, my mother said to me, "I hope you will fall into good hands, but a horse never knows who may buy him or who may drive him. Some men are kind and thoughtful, like our master; others can be cruel. Remember, do your best, whatever happens, and keep up your good name." Early in May, a man came from Squire Gordon's to take me away. I was taken into a big stable which had four good stalls and a swinging window that opened into the yard. In the next stall to me was a pony called Merrylegs, whom the children used to ride. He was a favourite with everyone, and he and I soon became great friends. There was a stable boy called James Howard, and the coachman's name was John Manley. He had a wife and one little child, and they lived in the coachman's cottage very near to the stables. The next day, I was taken to my new master so that he could try me out. I found that Squire Gordon was a very good rider and kind to his horse as well. When we came home, his lady was at the hall door to greet us. "Well, my dear," she said, "how do you like him?" He has a fine spirit," my master replied. "What shall we call him?" She looked up at me. "He really is a beauty, and he has such a sweet, good-tempered face and such a fine, intelligent eye. How about Black Beauty? Black Beauty? Why, yes, that shall be his name." And so it was. Also in our stable was a chestnut mare called Ginger. Although she was rather bad-tempered, we grew quite friendly. Sometimes we went out together in double harness, and then we talked to each other. She wanted to know all about my early life, and I told her. Then she told me about her life, and it was very different from mine. No one had ever been kind to Ginger. After she had been broken in, she was sent to London to a fashionable gentleman as one of the matching pair. There, I was driven with a bearing rein," she said, "and I really hated it. I like to toss my head about and hold it as high as any horse. But just imagine, 
if, if you tossed your head up high and had to hold it there for hours on end, that's what happens with a bearing rain. I grew more and more irritable. One day, just as they were straining my head up with that rain, I began to plunge and kick with all my might. That was the end of that place. I was sold and went back to the country. Alas, the groom at the new place was rough, so I bit him. I was sold again and came here not long before you did. It's better here, of course, but for how long? As it turned out, kindness was all Ginger needed. Her bad temper slowly died, and she became quite gentle and happy at Birtwick Park. A Stormy Day One late autumn day, my master and John had to go on a long journey on business. I was put into the dog cart, which I always enjoyed. We went along merrily until we came to a low wooden bridge. The river banks were rather high, and the bridge, instead of rising in the middle, went across straight and level. That meant that if the river was full, the water would be nearly up to the wooden planks. Master had to pay at the toll gate before we could cross. The man there said the river was rising fast, and he feared it would be a bad night. We started for home late in the afternoon. By then, the wind was blowing so hard that a big tree crashed to the ground beside the road. I heard the master say to John that he had never been out in such a storm. It was very nearly dark by the time we got back to the bridge. We could just see that the water was over the middle of it. But as that happened sometimes when the river was high, master did not stop. We were going along at a good pace. But the moment my feet touched the first part of the bridge, I knew there was something wrong. I did not dare to go forward, so I stopped dead. There's something wrong, sir, said John. He sprang out of the dog cart and tried to lead me forward. Come on, beauty. What's the matter? Just then, the man at the toll gate on the other side ran out of the house, waving a torch about and shouting at the top of his voice. What's the matter? shouted my master. The bridge is broken in the middle, and part of it is carried away. You can't cross. Thank God, said my master. You beauty, said John, and took the bridle and gently turned me round to the right-hand road by the riverside. The next bridge was much further up the river, and we had a long way to go. At last, we came home to the hall. As we came up, Mistress ran out, saying, Are you really safe, my dear? Oh, I have been so anxious. Have you had an accident? No, my dear. But if your black beauty had not been wiser than we were, we should all have been carried down the river at the wooden bridge. Then John took me to the stable. Oh, what a fine supper he gave me that night. A good bran mash and some crushed beans with my oats, and such a thick bed of straw. I was glad of it, for I was tired. The Fun My master and mistress decided one day to visit some friends who lived about fifty miles away. James Howard, the stable boy, was to drive them. He was leaving us shortly to go to a better job and needed the practice in driving. The first day, we travelled thirty-two miles. There were long, heavy hills, but James drove so carefully that Ginger and I were not at all harassed. Just as the sun was going down, we reached the town where we were to spend the night. We stopped at a big hotel in the marketplace. We drove into a long yard, and two ostlers came to take us to our stalls in a long stable. Later on in the evening, a traveller's horse was brought in by one of the ostlers. While the ostler was grooming, a young man with a pipe in his mouth came into the stable for a gossip. "'I say, Towler,' said the ostler, "'run up into the loft and put some hay down into this horse's rack, will you? Only put your pipe down first. "'All right,' said the other. A few moments later, I heard him step across the floor overhead and put down the hay. Then James came in for a last look at us before he went to bed. When he left, the door was locked and we were left alone. 
I don't know what time of night it was, but I woke up feeling very uncomfortable. The stable seemed full of smoke, and I could hardly breathe. I heard Ginger coughing, and the other horses seemed restless, pulling at their halters, and many of them were stamping. I heard a soft rushing noise and a low crackling. There was something so strange about it that it made me tremble all over. At last, Dick Towler burst in with a lantern and began to untie the horses to lead them out. He seemed so frightened himself that he frightened us as well, and none of us would go with him. He tried us all in turn, then left the stable. I saw a red light flickering on the wall and heard a roaring noise. Then there was a cry of fire. The next thing I heard was James's voice, quiet and cheery as it always was. Come on, Beauty, we'll soon be out of here. He took the scarf off his neck and tied it lightly over my eyes. And patting and coaxing, he led me out of the stable. When we were safe in the yard, he slipped the scarf off my eyes and shouted, "Here, somebody, take this horse while I go back for another." A tall, broad man stepped forward and took me, and James ran back into the stable. I set up a shrill whinny as I saw him go. Ginger told me afterwards that whinny was the best thing I could have done for her. Had she not heard me, she would never have had the courage to come out. There was much confusion in the yard as the horses were brought out of other stables. I kept my eye fixed on the stable door where the smoke poured out thicker than ever, and I could see flashes of red light. Then I gave a joyful neigh. James was coming through the smoke, leading Ginger, who was coughing violently. Suddenly, there came a sound of galloping feet and loud rumbling wheels. Two horses dashed into the yard, pulling a heavy fire engine, and the firemen leapt to the ground. The flames rose in a great blaze from the roof. Next day, everyone was wondering how the fire had started. At last, an ostler remembered that Dick Towler had been smoking a pipe when he came into the stable. Dick said that he had put his pipe down, but no one believed him. Pipes were never allowed in the stable at Birtwick Park, and I thought it ought to be the rule everywhere.